Now, we are going to talk about state student privacy laws. And I want us to hearken back to the Siegel framework that I had talked about at the beginning of this boot camp. So uh, we have a risk of non-compliance with various student privacy laws. We have the potential that uh, there could be a privacy or security issue, regardless of whether or not that is out of a particular law. And then we have perception issues. And I'm circling back to this framework because the perception issues are really what has driven this entire legal framework, everything that has happened over the past five years. So what are some of those perception concerns? Commercialism. There's uh, a lot of parents who are concerned that third parties are getting their kids' information and are using it to market to their kids or to show them ads or potentially sell it um, and use it to market to them at some point in time. And so that's a fear that we saw again and again coming up in states and is reflected in a lot of the state student privacy laws that I'm going to be talking about. Bad actors. We've seen a lot of folks worried based on the many, 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 many <laughs> breaches, um, not only of districts and educational institutions, but also of major companies, major governmental institutions. And we're in a space where it feels like no data that exists in whatever the amorphous cloud is is safe. And so we've seen some consideration of how do you deal with bad actors, some of which are technologically feasible, some of which are not, uh, appear in state student privacy laws. Putting students on tracks. Parents are worried that their child's education record, that the permanent record could follow their kids throughout the rest of their lives or just stop them from getting access to a particular opportunity, which makes sense because there's a lot of historical data that is used to build some of the personalized learning tools we use, some of the uh, student success initiatives that isn't so much accurate as it is biased. For example, uh, if you look at whether a female student down the line should be a doctor, historical data would tell you that females historically do worse uh, in seeking to be a doctor and instead that student should be pointed to becoming a nurse instead, which as all of us know reflects historical issues where women weren't necessarily welcome in medical school. And so this is a valid concern, it has come up it hasn't necessarily appeared in all laws, but it's certainly something that's in the back of the minds of a lot of the legislators as they've written these things. And then there's concerns about general unknowns. I mentioned the amorphous cloud. What is a cloud? How do we define these terms? How much jargon are we using as a district or an ed tech company as we are trying to explain to the general public on our website or in individual conversations with parents about what all of this means. And so that has really driven this landscape, where in the last five years, just the last five years, you've had 39 states in DC pass 126 laws specific to student privacy. 126. We're reaching almost a thousand laws that have been introduced over the past five years in all 50 states. And in addition to this 126 laws, you also have another probably 60, 70 that deal with student privacy in some way, but it's minor. The focus of the bill wasn't on student privacy. And so this legal landscape is layered, is complicated. You obviously have states that have passed more than one law in many cases, and it makes it impossible for districts, for companies, for others to know 
what on earth they are supposed to do in order to be compliant. And if you need a list of the laws that have passed since 2013, we have one available on our website that we update on an ongoing basis. And we'll soon be launching a page that just lists the statute numbers uh, of the laws also prior to 2013, which a few states did have. So generally speaking, these laws fall into two buckets. Uh, one is really building on FERPA. So it's looking at the state education agency, at districts, at schools, and saying, OK, we need to add some data governance here. We need to make this a little more specific. So it's looking at things like collection. How is data being gathered? What types of data are gathered? Is parental consent needed? Who can see the data? Who can use it? Who is able to access it? Can you turn it over to the federal government, to state government, to districts, to researchers? Who can you share the data with? Who are the partners who are able to access this data? And I will uh, point out a data quality campaign, who is one of my partners in crime, who have uh, been tracking these laws over the past five years, has done a summary of the state student privacy laws each year um, and expanded it out to just data laws in general regarding schools. Um, so worth looking up those summaries. And then the other bucket of laws goes back to those concerns I was talking about. So worries about commercialism, worries about st putting students on tracks, worries about what does all of this mean? And so you had a law that was originated in 2014 in California, so PIPA, which was aimed at, in plain language, stating many of the things that were just stated to you about FERPA. So that uh, information about how FERPA applied to online educational services wasn't released until, I believe, 2015. And so when this debate was going on in 2013 and 2014, there were a lot of people saying, well, FERPA doesn't apply to third parties at all. So when companies get data, they can sell it, and they can advertise, and they can do whatever they want with it. And so legislators took that concern and decided to turn it into very straightforward statements about what vendors can and cannot do with data. So operators cannot target advertising on their website or any other website using information acquired from students. They can't create a profile for a student except for educational purposes. They can't sell student data. They can't disclose it except in furtherance of the purpose for which they were given the data. They have to protect the information through reasonable security procedures. They have to delete data when they are told to by the school. And operators must disclose student information when required by law. They can uh, use it for research purposes, often for uh, improving and sometimes marketing their product if the information is de-identified. And you just set out this whole new legal framework for vendors that has now been copied in about 25 states. So the onus previously with FERPA and with many of the state laws was on the district and the state to make sure that vendors were in compliance. And this turned the table just a little bit and required that vendors have direct liability if they were not following SOPIPA or the various state laws modeled after that. You also have laws that added to the requirements for vendors, but put the onus again on the districts. So requiring that certain provisions be in contracts, that um, making sure to state clearly that the local education agency owns and controls student records, uh, describes how students can control content created for education-related purposes, prohibited from using information outside of the purpose for which it was given. This all is going to start to sound very familiar. Um, they restated these provisions in as many ways as possible across multiple state laws in many states. And so again and again, as I said, you're seeing these concerns that came out that were entirely perception-based. There were not stories about you know, a particular thing that went wrong. 
It was instead the fear and the lack of information that parents and others were facing when they were asking, what student data is collected, how is it being used, and how is it being protected? So unfortunately, with anything perception related, you ended up getting some unintended consequences. And so we saw a lot of states, uh, particularly those who passed laws in 2014, end up with unintended consequences from their student privacy laws. So let's take a quick poll. How many of you would be in favor of a student privacy law that bans the selling of student information? And I think most people would be. But the tricky thing with that <laughs> is that you just ban school photography and school yearbooks. As Ross was stating, FERPA says, and most of the state laws echo this, that personally identifiable information includes the information related to a student, which includes things like photographs, voice recordings, handwriting, all sorts of stuff, anything that can be traced back to the student, which means when you have a straight ban on selling student data, you're gonna end up having some issues. Now, we all like school photos, but that doesn't sound like that big of a problem. We ended up with some bigger problems. So Louisiana, strictest student privacy law in the country, uh, has jail time if you make a mistake. Uh, so districts are motivated <laughs> to pay attention to this law. Um, and Louisiana's law essentially required an opt-in for any sharing of student data. And so you had teachers going to student homes at night, you had you know, uh, people afraid to announce football player names at games, hang student artwork at the hallway, and most unfortunately refer a couple kids to the state scholarship fund because they couldn't get their parents' signature. The next year, the law was amended uh, to essentially allow districts to create their own version of a state privacy law that would supersede the state privacy law if they passed a policy. So now you have several state privacy laws uh, throughout the districts of Louisiana um, with jail time still on the hook. Um, so we have seen some attempt to address when there are unintended consequences from states. So New Hampshire had a video recording law required the school board and others to sign off on any video recording and it ended up limiting video recording for IEPs, which was a big problem and they had to amend the law the following year. Connecticut passed a law in 2016 requiring a contract with each and every single vendor that was used, which meant that if you know one or two kids in a district were using Dragon Dictation as part of their IEP, that district had to go and negotiate with Dragon Dictation, and you better believe that you know not Dragon Dictation specifically. Sorry for using you as an example, but um, that those large companies where you only had a couple kids, where it was off the shelf software, did not reply to districts. And so you had districts who had to cut off library subscriptions uh, because the law was so onerous. And we've sort of seen this pop up again and again. Fortunately, the laws started getting better as legislators realized that they had to consult with those on the ground, that they had to work with districts and others to actually tell them how schools were working. It's worth remembering that the first statewide adoption of one-to-one -one device programs was in 2009. We just hit the 10-year mark. And so no one who's in the legislature went to school in the ed tech environment we have now. And so the understanding of how all of this works is not something they have at their fingertips. Despite everyone feeling like, I went to school, I understand how it works, why do we need this fancy stuff that I didn't have? Um, 
the more that legislators listen, the better the laws ended up being. And some of the best laws do have new versions or new tweaks coming out to better explain the laws and make it easier for districts to know what their responsibilities are. So we've started seeing all of this die down a bit. Um, we've seen fewer student privacy aimed laws with the notable exception of Illinois this past year. Um, but instead we've started seeing a different trend, which has also been a little alarming, which is a lot of laws passing that don't consider student privacy, that don't include privacy guardrails to make sure student information is protected and student opportunities are allowed to flourish. Um, so you've especially seen this with school safety initiatives. We'll discuss that in the next panel. Um, but also in some states, uh, like we now have two states that require cameras be placed in special ed classrooms meant to prevent uh, issues of abuse that have come up but have been implemented in a way that's not necessarily privacy protective and certainly not affordable for most districts. Um, so there are still things coming up and still things to pay attention to, but how on earth are districts supposed to understand and comply with all of these things? It is an open question and hopefully the panels throughout the rest of the day will help answer that question for you. But I can give you some trends to watch. So contracts, we're gonna discuss this in detail, a student data privacy consortium, other groups, more and more have found that individual vetting of apps is not worth the time because as anyone who has a smartphone knows, a new app will be coming out with an update tomorrow and all of the vetting that you just did may no longer be applicable to the version of the app. Uh, and so you've seen a lot of these agreements be put on paper. You also have specified security standards in a couple states. Most of the state laws focused on reasonable security standards for years and years because you don't want to codify a security requirement in a law because laws are very slow and security and hackers are very fast. And so you ended up uh, with a lot of very vague language and parents and others pushed back and said, this is a problem, this sounds weak, it allows vendors to get away with too much, we need to specify things. And so laws have been specifying things and it's unclear whether vendors and most certainly unclear whether districts are able to live up to some of those required security standards. So I mentioned Illinois, they had proposed requiring both HIPAA level technical safeguards and the NIST framework as the security standards, not only for vendors, but for all districts in the state. It ended up that portion of the law not passing, um, but it was a big conversation. New York has similarly been considering this as part of their regulations uh, for their 2014 law. The law already requires uh, HIPAA level encryption for all vendors uh, who are operating in schools in New York. I would bet most vendors don't know that. <laughs> um, uh, you also had New Hampshire recently uh, set a security standard. Their districts have to follow NIST 800-171, which by the way is a really high standard that is generally applied to higher ed institutions uh, that are receiving federal grants. And so how these standards are going to play out is an open question. But there's a reason these standards are being applied. I used to hear a lot of people say, you know what, we don't have social security numbers. We don't have financial information. People aren't gonna have their identity stolen. So the data we have at school isn't sensitive. Problem with that is it's sensitive to the people whose data it is. And so when you had hackers who were trying to troll the FBI, they went to four rural districts in different states, likely more than that, but those are the ones that were publicized. And they got access to student information system, to the video cameras, to everything, sent ransom letters to one superintendent referencing Sandy Hook and saying that they were gonna disclose special ed and discipline information of kids to the community if they didn't pay up. In another school district, they sent death threats via text message to parents and students. 
They posted a list of all students and their contact information and grades saying pedophiles now had a list that they could pick off of. So the data we hold is incredibly sensitive and incredibly important to keep safe. And then the next interesting trend we're seeing more and more is training. So we've started to see a lot of laws requiring training. Unfortunately, most of them don't also require the resources to do that training. But this is a step up, at least from my perspective, because none of these laws, none of these 126 laws can possibly be implemented with fidelity if no one is trained on what they are and how they work. Um, so the fact that we actually do have some training now required has been useful in pushing folks forward and being like, yes, we have to sit through this required training, but at least somebody is hearing that there are laws, that there are protections, and that as teachers and administrators, we are stewards of student data. And it is very important that that data be protected and explaining to folks why that data needs to, to be protected is important. Now, if legislatures would just fund it as well, I think we'd all be very, very happy. Um, but fortunately, there are many free resources which are available at the link in the Google Doc. Enforcement. None of these laws have been enforced yet. We have lots of questions about what the first case is going to be. In many states, uh, the AG is in charge of enforcement, uh, generally against the specific vendors. Um, in some states, uh, you have the Department of Ed chief privacy officer as the enforcer. Um, how this is going to play out is going to be really interesting because in the absence of enforcement, we've actually seen a lot of privacy activists and parents say that, you know what, 126 isn't enough. We need more laws. We need to actually get enforcement. And sometimes they're pushing for a private right of action. Sometimes they're just pushing for another law, which to me is counterintuitive if you're going for enforcement. But um, it is important to remember that while we all may, to some extent, dread <laughs> the enforcement that is coming down the pike for these state student privacy laws as districts that already have limited resources, without enforcement, we are seeing a push to do more legislatively and to allow parents, perhaps, to directly sue school districts or have other ways to enforce their privacy. And then consumer privacy laws. We're also seeing a ton of states introduce general laws about privacy that protect all consumers, not just students. And how this will intersect with the student privacy landscape is not clear. The one state uh, that passed a law last year, California, um, intersects in very weird ways with its existing, I think, four student privacy laws. And schools really aren't sure, like, could a student call up and make a vendor delete their attendance record, their testing data? Um, and so as these laws continue to be passed, we had one other state adopt one this year. We are certain to probably see another 20 states introduce a consumer privacy law next year. How this is all going to work together and how much clarity there is about how schools and their vendors fit into the situation is likely going to depend on how active people are in speaking to state legislatures about these issues and being like, remember the schools, we exist. Um, really quickly, um, because I want to give a little bit of time for questions. Um, it's really important in considering all of this, as I said, there's so many perception-based concerns, and it's important that we're all here at ISTE. We are about to hear about a million amazing, amazing technologies with a lot of potential, but don't live in the tech bubble, because it is a very dangerous place to be. Shiny, shiny ed tech is not perceived as good by a lot of people, and there's a lot of people who worry about the motivations of for-profit and even non-profit companies that are in this space. Um, and there are a lot of things you can do to make sure that you're taking this into consideration. So ask privacy questions of your vendors. 
figure out what they're doing on privacy. If they can't answer that on the floor at ISTE, that's a problem. It should be baked into their marketing. It should be baked into the work they do because the student privacy space with all these laws is very different than the general consumer space and companies need to be aware of that. Plan for bad actors and mistakes. You can have the most secure, the most privacy protective vendor in the world, but if your teacher's password is password, then there's a vulnerability in the system. Or if it's on a post-it next to their computer, a student can easily hack, or some variation of what hack means, uh, that account and change their grade or something else. And so remembering that, um, is very important as you look at that training, as you think about all of this. Consider the creepy factor. There was a product I heard about a few years ago at an ed tech summit that was like, yeah, we hook kids up to this thing when they're angry and then they play this game and as they calm down, the game gets easier and it teaches them to you know, regulate their impulses. And I was like, this sounds really creepy. <laughs> um, also, really useful. If you are trying to give students the long-term skill of being able to calm themselves down, that could be extremely helpful. That's also not something that you need to do without parental consent and full transparency. And so considering how you not only which tools you choose to adopt, but also how you then communicate that and whether or not you allow parents the opportunity to actively opt in or opt out is really important. Um, spreading the word. There needs to be more people in this conversation. There are so many districts that I've talked to that I'm like, yeah, your state passed 15 privacy laws, and they're like, what? Uh, so make sure that other people know about this. It's really, really, really important. Um, and doesn't have to mean that you don't have tech, but if people aren't involved in this conversation, you might have states that ban tech. The original version of the Illinois bill this year banned personalized learning. Um, like there is very much so a need for people to be in this conversation, not only to protect privacy, but also to protect the opportunity to use data and tech in the classroom to help students. And then stay informed, demand privacy help. I've seen so many professional membership organizations that are like, you know what, privacy's fine, but my members aren't asking for it. And so you don't have presentations on privacy uh, from you know, the teachers' conferences or other conferences, colleges of teacher education. Speak up. Make them include this. Make them talk more about privacy and get more people the best practices and access to at least the questions to ask, if not the answers. Um, and use the million resources that are in that you Google Doc. Use the people who are going to be on the panels throughout the day. They're some of the top student privacy experts in the country, and you don't have to remake the wheel. There are a million model policies and websites and language to send home to parents and how to vet apps. All of that is out there, and you just have to get to it. Um, there are a ton of resources, as I said, and I sort of tend to sort them into these buckets um, just for ease of use. Um, and I've sorted them into these buckets in the Google Doc um, so you can sort of pick out which resources are most useful to you. So with that, I will turn things over pretty quickly to questions. Yes. So on the federal side of all of this, uh, it, it's been an interesting journey over the past couple of years. So we've seen, I think the high watermark, we saw eight bills introduced in Congress in 2015 that would rewrite FERPA in some way, directly regulate vendors in some way. The tricky thing is, of course, education is a local thing. And uh, so it's very difficult to pass a law that would preempt that without preemption, without you know, something coming down that says states can still have a higher standard for vendors, vendors aren't gonna support it. 
And so you end up with a system where either you have one federal standard, which will probably be lower than at least some of the state standards, certainly Louisiana's, um, but, but you don't really, it, it's just been a very difficult needle to thread. Um, it's possible with all the privacy conversation on the consumer side and the focus on child privacy that you might see a vendor specific law pop up uh, in Congress and move, but at the moment, not a lot of likelihood. On the FERPA side, it's a little more likely that we will see something Congress has really wanted there to be a FERPA rewrite before there's a vendor side bill so you'd have more obligations added to you as a district before the vendors <laughs> get it which might be a little backward but um it would include a lot of the same provisions that are in the state laws in terms of additional data governance and what has to be in contracts with third parties and all of that um but again it's not going to preempt the individual state laws so no matter what at best, you probably have 50 different laws that um, are somewhat similar to each other. Other questions? The question was, how do you deal with districts that have very few resources and can barely, you know, the IT director is also the principal, is also the gym teacher, is also the history, um, and how do you actually get the ball rolling on all of this? So the answer to that is the simplistic version is just to start somewhere. Um, start impressing on people that privacy is important, security is important, share the story of the hackers that went after exactly those districts. Um, there are federal grants available and other things for smaller districts on security issues in particular. Um, but you're never going to be able to, as a district that has maybe 60 kids in some cases, meet incredibly high security standards. And so all you can do is take one step forward at a time, learn as much as you can, perhaps outsource some privacy and security stuff to others, and then jump on the bandwagon of those larger districts. So the best model I've seen for this um, What'll be discussed later on is California's uh, Student Data Privacy Consortium addendum allows other districts uh, to jump on the work of a district that negotiated a privacy addendum with a particular vendor, and the district's able to say, yeah, I want that too, and just hop on board. And that way they are protected by the same contractual agreement. So lots of options there. Yes. There are very few enforcement actions. There are very few ways to enforce. And perhaps until we hold people's feet to the fire, uh, we won't see actions on privacy and security. And that's not necessarily how we wanna go about it either. There's limited dollars, there's limited time, there's limited resources, and we want districts to be able to serve students. And so, what we've seen here, th there's a couple of different things. First of all, a lot of people say that FERPA is toothless because you haven't had you know, federal funding taken away from a district or an educational institution. Thing is, FERPA requires remediation. I think, honestly, FERPA does the absolute right thing and has the absolute right balance, which says that we're not gonna come after you and take away all your federal money um, because you made a mistake or because you didn't understand this law that your district or your college of teacher education never trained you on. Instead, we're gonna come out and we're gonna say, here's how you fix that. Here's how you do it next time. And you only viol violate FERPA when you have a policy or practice of violating FERPA. <laughs> and so you end up with a system where FERPA is actually being enforced all the time, it's just that enforcement is people like the Privacy Technical Assistance Center, like Family Policy Compliance Office coming out and saying, here's how to do better. 
Here's how you fix this for next time. And I think that's probably, especially on the school district and state side, the right balance to strike. And in many ways, the balance that would be retained in the vast majority of federal proposals to rewrite FERPA because nobody thinks that there should be, you know, one shot and your federal funding's gone or even that it's one shot and you are suddenly finding a district and taking that money out of the pockets of maybe special ed students or others. Um, and so figuring out the balance is important. I always emphasize it, it's not so much about teachers learning all of the things that you guys have learned this morning about the details of FERPA, like studying FERPA unto itself is, you know, a PhD. <laughs> but um, it, it's about knowing enough to ask questions. It's about sort of moving that vendor market. It's about taking small steps to do a little better on security, to double check that attachment, to not click on the phishing link, to uh, attach the right thing, to make sure in small ways that we're improving children's privacy in every way we can. That's been an, an interesting question that's come up more and more. How do we make sure that vendors are held accountable? So there's a mix of this. You have the laws like SOPIPA that directly require them to do things, and the state AG can enforce against them if they don't. You have states where, uh, New York specifically, where the chief privacy officer actually has the power to request documents and go in and audit vendors. Uh, which is, I think, unique among all of the state student privacy laws. Um, in the various contracts that are being created, there's al almost always a provision that requires some sort of penalty if the vendor is violating that agreement. Many vendors have signed things like the Student Privacy Pledge, which requires legally that they adhere to the commitments that they make as part of that pledge. The key is making sure that when violations happen, they're reported, which is the tricky part. And where a lot of districts are struggling is when you don't, you know, you barely have money to have a privacy person, how do you possibly find the money to audit and to make sure that vendors are doing what they should do? And that's still an open question. There, there are a few third party um, verifications that are really reputable, like SOC 2, like I'm trying to remember the higher ed one, H, HECFA. thank you, HECFA. Yes, we're three stating there is no such thing as a FERPA seal of approval. Um, absolutely, so just to restate, absolutely. I think training on best practices is absolutely the way to go as opposed to specific here's legally what you are required to do, if only because they will turn out, tune out, and then nothing will happen. Yeah, how do you practically apply this in your life and in your classroom? I think digital citizenship is a great way to do it. You can train teachers by having them train students in best practices, uh, double the work half the time.